Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Mike Anderson and I'm an executive at Saab as well as a board director here at the Atlantic Council. On behalf of Saab and the Atlantic Council Skullcroft Center for Strategy and Security as well as its forward defense program, I would like to welcome you to this final installment of our 2023 Commander Series titled Designing the Future Joined Force with Admiral Christopher Grady. Admiral Grady, thank you so much for joining us today. When Saab and the Atlantic Council first launched the Commander Series in 2009, our vision was to establish a flagship speakers forum for senior military and defense leaders to discuss the most important security challenges, both now and in the future. This series has been very important for defense companies like Saab, helping us better understand challenges and priorities in order to inform our investments and partnerships, particularly when it comes to research and development, while better preparing ourselves to meet future capability needs. Today's event is the final installment of the Commander Series this year. Looking back on a very successful year for this series, we've had the honor of hosting Commander of U.S. Southern Command, General Laura Richardson, for a conversation on security challenges facing Latin America. Commander of U.S. Air Force in Europe and Air Force Africa, General James Hecker, to discuss the future of U.S. and Allied air power in the European and African theaters. Secretary of the U.S. Air Force, Frank Kendall, for a conversation on the air and space force imperatives for strategic competition. And most recently, U.S. Chief of Space Operations, General Chance Saltzman, who discussed his theory of success for deterring conflict and promoting long-term stability in the space domain. Today, we're delighted to host the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Christopher Grady, as he outlines his long-term vision for implementing the recently released 2023 Joint Warfighting Concept. Admiral Grady, thank you again for spending time with us today. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from your insights of the course of the next hour. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce General Jim Jones, who will introduce our guest and moderator. General Jones is the Executive Chairman Emeritus of the Atlantic Council and Founder, President, and CEO of Jones Group International. He has a distinguished career serving in roles across the U.S. government and military, including as the 32nd Commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps, the commander of U.S. European Command and Supreme Allied Commander Europe, and the National Security Advisor to President Barack Obama. General Jones, thank you for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mike, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction and for Saab's support of the Council's Commander Series. I'm looking forward to our discussion with today's distinguished guest, and we're fortunate, as Mike mentioned, to be joined by the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Christopher Grady. Chris, thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to hearing your insights. I would also like to thank the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security's Forward Defense Program for hosting this very timely event. Here at the Atlantic Council, the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security works to develop sustainable, nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States, our allies, and partners. Consistent with that mission, Forward Defense generates ideas and connects stakeholders in the defense ecosystem to promote an enduring military advantage for the United States, its allies, and our partners. Its work identifies the defense strategies, capabilities, and resources the United States needs to, de to defer and, if necessary, I'm sorry, to deter and, if necessary, prevail in any future conflict. The United States has long relied on its unrivaled conventional arsenal to, de to deter and, if necessary, fight and win wars. However, the 21st century security environment is growing in complexity as near peer competitors in China and Russia contest U.S. military advantage on the global stage. As Russia continues its campaign of armed aggression against Ukraine, China modernizes its military and takes an increasingly assertive posture in the Indo-Pacific region. Moreover, warfare today exists across multiple domains, from the traditional physical domains of air, land, and sea, into the cyberspace and information domains, 
and is intensified through emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence. However, while technological advancements are imperative to maintaining the joint forces competitive advantage, the Pentagon's bureaucratic, bureaucratic and acquisition barriers sometimes slow their adoption at scale. It's something the Admiral knows quite a bit about. How will the Joint Chiefs of Staff manage the myriad of security challenges facing the United States today, all the while building the force needed for the future fight? Responding to this challenge, the Joint Chiefs of Staff have unveiled the 2023 Joint Warfighting Concept, which presents a new strategic vision for how the Joint Force will innovate and adapt to the changing character of warfare. And so today, we are very fortunate to be joined by the Vice Chairman, who will share with us his vision for advancing the Joint Forces modernization imperatives while ensuring its present readiness to deter or, if necessary, prevail in a near-term conflict. As Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Grady is the second highest ranking military officer and oversees the design and development of the Joint Force. He has led a distinguished career of military service with nearly 40 years in the U.S. Navy serving across combatant commands and in the Joint Staff. He will become the first Vice Chairman to finish a full four-year term in this position. Admiral Grady, thank you for your dedication to our national security, and we all look forward to your remarks today. Moderating today's conversation is Courtney Cube, who serves as a correspondent covering national security and the military for NBC News Investigated Unit. She has covered national security news since 2001. So before I turn it over to Courtney and, and the Admiral, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is public and on the record. We encourage our audience on Zoom to direct any questions to the Vice Chairman using the Ask AC link, which you can find in the chat. Be sure to identify yourself and your affiliation and your questions. We will be collecting them throughout the event, and Courtney will pose some of them to Admiral Grady. We also encourage our online audience to join the conversation on Twitter by following at ACS Scowcroft and using the hashtag Forward Defense. Thanks to everyone for joining the Atlantic Council for what I know will be a captivating conversation. And so, Courtney, without further ado, over to you. Thank you, General. Um, before we begin, I want to give Admiral Grady a few minutes here to, uh, to give some opening remarks, but I also just want to foot stomp what we heard from General Jones. If you have any questions, I, they will be popping up on this screen here. I'm technologically challenged, but they assure me this is very easy to use. So. They'll be popping up here. It's askac.org. Submit your questions early and often. Admiral Grady. Yeah, thanks, Courtney. And let me uh, let me offer my thanks to uh, the Atlantic Council, the Scowcroft Center, to Mike and to General Jones. Thanks for having me. Thanks to all of you here and uh, and out in VTC land. Really appreciate the dialogue that we're about to have. It's an important discussion, um, and I really look forward to uh, uh, to what we're going to talk about. As the general said, I am the first for whom the vice chairmanship is a four-year job. I'm also the first for whom uh, I cannot be the chairman, and that's a pretty empowering position uh, to be in. And it's a position that I think rests at the intersection of kind of four worlds. The first is policy. So I spend a lot of time um, over at the White House as part of the deputies committee, helping to shape policy um, for, for, uh, for, the, for the president going forward. Of course, there's the requirements process, of which I am the chairman of the Joint Requirements Oversight Council. There's acquisition, and then there's budgeting, where my best battle buddy there as the co-chair of the DMAG is, is the Deputy Secretary of Defense. So it's a unique position in the Pentagon where you stand at the intersection of those four worlds. Um, and the JROC is kind of front and center uh, to what we do, and we can talk about the JROC later. Um, you know, the NDS, the National Defense Strategy, is pretty clear on the imperatives uh, the Secretary has given us, which are to defend the homeland to deter strategic attack, uh, to deter um, uh, uh, aggression, and but be ready to prevail, and then to build a resilient joint force and a defense ecosystem. And in that regard, then, I look at everything through two lenses. There's the force lens and the foundry lens. The force is going out and fighting, winning. Uh, the, the purview of the COCOMs who do such great work, and then the foundry lens being all of the things that enable that fight, 
the man training and equip uh, pieces, uh, if you will. Um, and when we do that, then the national military strategy says that we must be very attuned to the central military problem, which is strategic discipline. And this is how do we balance the now with the future, the current readiness with the force modernization, with ensuring war fighting advantage now, but being able to deter today. And that is the challenge of the, um, of the national military strategy. And I'll close my opening remarks by saying none of this happens without a good understanding of the center of the universe. And that is the soldiers and the sailors, the airmen, the Marines and the guardians and the Coast, Guardian, Coast Guardsmen. We would, at our peril, forget that they are indeed our greatest uh, asymmetric advantage. And everything we do, whether it's on the force side or the foundry side, is to enable their success. Great. Thank you, Admiral. Um, so the goal here today is to discuss Admiral Grady's plan to modernize the joint force and meet the challenge of strategic competition with China, which obviously we will, we will get to. There's so much to discuss on this topic. But I, I do want to start with some major news we had over the weekend, sure. of course. On Sunday, Houthi rebels fired multiple anti-ship cruise missiles mm -hmm. targeting at least three commercial ships in the Red Sea. The USS Kearney responded to the distress calls. During the course of the day, they shot down at least three attack drones fired by the Houthis. This isn't the first time that we've seen activity by the Houthis in the last several weeks, certainly not in the last several years, but it's really ticked up in the last several weeks. Mm -hmm. What can the U.S. do to stop these Houthi attacks? Yeah, sure. It is a first for such discreet attacks on international shipping. Mm -hmm. You're right. As a matter of fact, just several weeks ago, Carney was involved with uh, uh, shooting down um, both uh, uh, land attack cruise missiles and and uh, unmanned aerial systems. But this is a first for attacks on international shipping, and that's a big deal. Um, and so if you think about uh, what it mean, what the international flow of commerce means going through one of the key ch choke, choke points in the world, the, the Babo Mandeb Straits, this is not just a U.S. problem. This is an international problem. And you correctly point out that Carney was on station and USS Mason was on station as well, uh, both of whom who have been uh, involved in uh, taking down various uh, 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 threats. So we were fortunate to be there. We, in fact, did respond to one of the vessels, which at one point was uh, concerned about uh, taking on water. They're in a good place now. Um, but it does suggest then uh, that our presence, along with our international allies and partners, is going to be really important in that, in that, key, in that key choke point. Um, so the question then now is, um, how do we do that with our allies and partners? And so I think what you will see um, from the maritime perspective um, is uh, through Central Command and, uh, and uh, the Naval Command that we have there in Bahrain, um, we will stand up what we have done in the Strait of Hormuz before, and that is the ability with our allies and partners, a key point, uh, to provide uh, some semblance of protection through that, that uh, key strait. In the meantime, we will uh, continue to work with our allies and partners about uh, potential response options uh, into, uh, uh, against the Houthis, and then keep our eye on is this, a, and it, it, it very much is, an expansion of perhaps the larger conflict that is in uh, Israel and Hamas. Because as, uh, as was noted earlier, um, there, is large, there is undoubtedly an Iranian hand in this. So this looks a little bit like horizontal escalation. Um, we'll keep an eye on that. When you say something like what we see in the Strait of Hormuz, are you talking about the, the, the maritime task force that's there? That's right. You think you'll, there'll be more of a presence in the, the Red Sea, maybe the Bab al-Mandeb going forward because of this threat? That's correct. Again, with our allies and partners, and at least there are over 30 nations that are part of the, the combined maritime force, the coalition maritime force that operates out of the Naval Central Command, out of the Fifth Fleet. Um, and already seven nations have stepped forward to say we're ready to help. You mentioned Iran. CENTCOM said last night that they're fully enabling these attacks by the Houthis. Is Iran directing the Houthis to carry out these sorts of attacks? Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be ready to say that. But uh, the Iranians uh, are clearly, as, as CENTCOM said, enabling by the transfer of technology and the, and the movement of, uh, of various ammunition. It is clear, though, that uh, if they say stop, I suspect they would. <laughs> Do you, would you, do you see a scenario where part of the security in the region is U.S. Marines going on these commercial ships? 
Yeah, that's an option that's available. Um, we have trained to that, um, uh, particularly when we were thinking about how to uh, uh, to affect that mission through the Strait of Hormuz. Um, so it's certainly an option that is on the table. You're talking about embark security teams. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an option that we have decided to put in play yet, but we are trained and ready to do that. Could you see a scenario where they, they we see reflagging? The Houthis have specifically said they want to go after Israeli commercial ships, mm -hmm. uh, which hasn't necessarily been the case here. There's been 14 plus nations involved, but could you see a scenario where we see a reflagging of ships to protect them, like like what happened during the tanker wars? Yeah, again, another option that's on the table. I think we're pretty far from that at this point. There's a lot that goes into that. Um, at, at, so again, we could do that, not necessarily going to do that. Mm -hmm. We know how to do that, um, but right now, I think we're, we're a bit away from that. You also, the, you mentioned the potential horizontal escalation. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that this, what, what we're seeing, this these continue, continuing behavior by the Houthis, which really has shown some new capabilities, some more aggressive behavior than we had seen yeah. there, is this evidence that the war in Israel and Gaza has really boiled over into a larger regional conflict? It could be. Um, and so that's one of the things that we want to track closely. Just listen to the, uh, the Houthis' own uh, public statements uh, about how, and the fa as you mentioned, that they're ta they intend to target only Israeli vessels. That's a pretty direct indicator to me that they are operating on behalf of, of others in, uh, in, that, uh, in that other crisis. And then just one more, are you, um, do you think that our U.S. military right now in harm's way in that region, in the Red Sea and in the Bab el-Mandeb? Sure, it's a dangerous place, but uh, as you can tell from, uh, from what Carney's been able to do and what Mason's been able to do, well-trained, frosty COs, good crews, ready to, ready to take it on. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I was, I was struck by is the fact that there, were, there have been a number of Chinese ships mm -hmm that have been in the region at sure. the time. Um, and, and as far as we know, there have never been a time where they've responded to any of these distress calls. Mm -hmm. um, is, is the U.S. in any communication with the Chinese captains that they would potentially be able to help out if necessary? Do you know if there's been any outreach to somehow bring the Chinese yeah. military to the You're referring, referring to their continuous task force presence that is uh, uh, largely in the Gulf of Oman. Um, they've been doing that for quite some time now, so a succession of repeated deployments to that area. In the past, they were part of the counter-piracy, and there was informal communications between them. I'm not aware of that happening right now. I would point out, though, that uh, there was a piracy event that happened about three or four days ago, perhaps a week ago, uh, in which the, uh, the Mason responded, um, was able to uh, take control, take back control of the vessel, uh, uh, detain uh, the pirates that were on board, uh, the Chinese didn't move uh, a yard to help. And those were believed to have been Somali pirates. They self-identified as Somali, I believe, right? They have. And, and is there any indication they have ties to the Houthis, that they were sent out there on behalf of the Houthis, on behalf of Iran or anything, or does this seem like it was just clearly Piracy, yeah. classic piracy, I guess. Yeah, but we, I, 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 don't, I don't think we have enough to, to, to connect the dots there. Could have been really bad timing on the part of those pirates. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the things that we're here talking about is, is designing the future force. And, and one thing that we've seen since the attacks on October 7th is the U.S. surging more capability into that region. There's two carrier strike groups there now, um, which we, we haven't seen a 2.0 carrier presence in the region. And it seems very plausible, the Ford's been extended, that this may be an extended period of a 2.0 presence there. I'm wondering if, um, is this straining U.S. Navy resources? And is there a concern that having this, having to respond in this way to this major world event could alter deployment rotation schedule to the point where it starts to strain readiness? Sure. Let me just correct one thing. Yeah. It's not 2.0, so it's 1.0 in CENTCOM, mm -hmm. and uh, the General R. Ford Strike Group is in UCOM right now. So will we have two who are there in that, in that yeah, yeah, with the so. yeah. schedule. But you're correct. You right? are correct. Navy guy, always correct, yeah, right? Sure. <laughs> um, so, um, and indeed, scheduled deployments. Yeah. Um, and at one point, if you recall, uh, when Dwight D. Eisenhower chopped into theater, at that point, the Navy had four carriers right. underway because you had the Ronald Reagan, the Carl Vinson operating together in the Western Pacific. So four carrier strike groups force generated to come forward. Um, 
Uh, that's what you get with that big chunk of those big pieces, those big chess pieces, right? That, uh, and and the, the robust force generation process that the United States Navy can, uh, can undertake. Um, yeah, decisions have been made to extend the General R. Ford Strike Group for all the right policy reasons and what it means from a, from a deterrence perspective. Rest assured, the Secretary and the President look at that very closely. There is a cost to that later um, uh, as we think about the force generation uh, uh, in the out years. So every time you extend, there's a there's a price to be paid there right now. It's a manageable cost. Uh, we're not at a tipping point uh, 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 from that perspective. The Dwight D. Eisenhower was supposed to be there. They're going to stay there. Mm -hmm. um, and we have other pieces on the board as well. Um, and this is also a place where allies and partners can come into play. So I was just in uh, I was just uh, overseas and I was with my uh, my counterpart in the UK and we talked a little bit about what their carrier might be able to do. We'll see how that plays out. But uh, uh, you know we don't fight alone. Do you have any, you said they're not at the tipping point now, but do you have any sense when that could, we, they could be at that tipping point? I mean, it's, it seems like we've, we, we've heard for so long that they're, you know, carrier rotations, the cycle is, is so tight, yeah. um, and there, there's not always a lot of wiggle room for, for major deviations. Mm -hmm. Frankly, like what they've seen over the last couple of years with the invasion of Ukraine and now with October 7th, are, are you, do you have any sense of how long it will be before they're at a tipping point where it really starts to impact the rotations and deployments of yeah, these I, carriers? Yeah, I think we have quite a bit of margin here. So as we execute what's known as the Optimized Fleet Response Plan, we know how to accommodate this. So as an example, when the carrier were, to, if the carrier were to come home, she would go into a sustainment period where she remains ready and trained to go. We'll lead into that sustainment period right now. Um, of course, we want to get her and her uh, her air wing uh, kind of you know off the ship and, and ready to train up for the next cycle. Carriers are, are uh, you know, it's a big piece of metal that's been riding around in the ocean for a while and needs to get some work done. But I think the uh, I think when we think about that OFRP, that Optimized Fleet Response Plan, we'll be able to accommodate that within the within the maintenance cycle before we push her into the next part of her training cycle. But the longer we go, the, hard, the harder that gets. Yeah. Um, after the APEC summit last month in San Francisco, the U.S. and Chinese military were supposed to start talking again. There were supposed right. to be maybe some maritime discussions mm -hmm. and things. We haven't heard that that's actually happening yet. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is You're there correct? Okay. Um, do you have any sense on when those may actually begin? Yeah. Well, first of all, mill to mill communications is where we want to be, right? And so. Um, you know, the, the, the discussions between President Biden and his counterpart led to this, this opening, and, um, and that's good. The more we talk, the less there is for a chance of miscalculation. The probability of buffoonery just goes way down when we're able to, when we're able to do that. Um, as you probably heard from the chairman, he was asked this question out at the Reagan Defense Forum, and he said, standing by. And so he is. And so we're ready uh, when they are, and I suspect we'll see that shortly. How about some like the, is it, I'm going to get the acronym wrong, MMCA, the maritime mm -hmm. discussions that I believe yeah. go at a PACOM level? Is mm -hmm. there any indication that those might go forward? Yeah, I think you're going to need to see the top level speak talk first. Okay. And so maybe it's the chairman who goes first. I don't know, perhaps the secretary or someone else. Or the vice chairman? Uh, uh, oh, okay. uh, maybe. Uh, I'm ready. Yeah. Put me and coach, if that's what you want. <laughs> uh, or perhaps even in, uh, Indo PACOM himself, Admiral Aquilino. And, we, and I think you might see that. So it could very well go, let's say, chairman, uh -huh. then Admiral Aquilino, and then maybe the MMCA. Yeah, the, the, uh, Admiral Aquilino is pretty open about talking about how he's been reaching out to his counterparts. Repeatedly. And repeatedly, and he's, yeah. I don't believe he's ever gotten, he can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I don't believe um, he's ever gotten. Rest response. assured, he will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but how does, is buffoonery, does that translate to Mandarin or no? Probably yeah. not, no, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll look that up afterwards. It's an I'll equation, make it, P sub B. I'll make a note of that one. Um, uh, Taiwan's presidential election is not too far away from now. Mm -hmm. China seems relatively nervous about it. I wonder if you have seen any changes in military actions by China that you can share here now that there may be an assessment could be relate, related to the election. And, and then as an aside to that, is, the, is that anything that the U.S. military is factoring in when talking about ways to get more support to, in the, the form of weapons to Taiwan yeah. in advance of that? Yeah, um, I, I don't think that the imminency of their election has led them to change their operating patterns there. Perhaps as we posture for that, they might respond to that, which I would entirely, entirely expect. Um, but the, you know, to your question about Taiwan, then 
um, you know, that's a dangerous period, and um, in accordance with our One China policy and uh, and uh, and the uh, uh, Taiwan Re Relations Act and the three communiques and the six assurances, we will continue to do what we need to do to ensure that Taiwan has what it needs to defend itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so that will continue um, uh, through the election, before the election, and beyond. Mm -hmm. Do you are, are you confident at this point that? I mean, right now there's there's so much focus on uh, helping to train up Ukraine, helping to equip Ukraine. Yeah. There's increasing focus on getting anything that Israel needs for the war there. Are you confident that with that that high op tempo, mm. the U.S. can still send Taiwan what they need in a timely enough manner to help them defend against the potential invasion of, of by China? I am. Um, you know, you, you, this is another Venn diagram problem, right? So you look at what is required to support Ukraine, you look at what might be required to support our partner in, in Israel, and then of course you put Taiwan on top of that. Not necessarily the same things, and so we're able uh, uh, we're able to uh, kind of work our, our work our way through that. We have the construct that we do with combatant commanders and the rest um, that should allow us to command and control control those three things all at one time. It's all part of our campaigning process, which is central to the, to the, uh, to the national defense um, strategy. Is it challenging? Sure. But, you know, as the Secretary has said, we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time, and I'm confident that, uh, that we can do that. But the, the, I mean, if you look at the, you know, again, the U.S. helping to support Israel, there's been all these attacks against bases in Iraq and Syria. Right. The, yeah. um, there's, of course, the invasion of, of Russia. And now with the potential for something happening in Taiwan, it's sort of like you're going to have to be able to walk, chew gum, and maybe pat your head on the, well, yeah. as you go all at the same time. Do you think all three of those would be sustainable for the U.S. to support all three of those eventualities at the same time? Yeah, I do. Uh, it eventualities. Uh, what we're doing right now, the steady state that we're in now, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Russia invasion into a sovereign state in Crimea and, and then followed into, uh, into, into Ukraine, certainly what's happening in Israel and, uh, and uh, you know, our support to Taiwan. We can do all of that. How about in the midst of the continuing resolution and the budget mm -hmm. crisis? How, um, I mean, is it possible to continue uh, to support Ukraine at the level the U.S. has been doing, to support Israel at what seems like it's only going to be an increasing level with additional weapons and, and whatever they need, and a, and a continuing, continuing resolution? Yeah. Let's talk about that yeah. first. <laughs> a never-ending yeah. continuing resolution. Why do we call it that? Yeah. I mean, continuing resolution is bad. I mean, if there's any takeaway from this discussion today, continuing resolutions are not where we want to be. We need that stable and predictable funding. It's just uh, the, 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 the process that we're in now, and I know Congress is working really hard, so I, you know, I, and we really appreciate that. But that uncertainty, those discontinuities, that lack of efficiency that comes from that, you know, as an example, as we operate uh, under this CR, our top line's 3% below what it would have been with the Pred's bud request for, for fiscal year uh, 24. And should uh, the Fiscal Responsibility Act kick in, that's another 1% haircut, right? So no new starch, can't buy more weapons. All those things that make it really, uh, that, that make it really challenging. Um, and on top of that then is the, is the desire on the part of the administration, a really strong one, a good one, uh, to have a supplemental. Right to support Ukraine, to support Taiwan, and some of the uh, some of the other things that we that we need to get done. Um, I want to ask one. I'm always a bum and forget to ask questions from the audience. Get the, so let's ask this one. Um, as chair of, of the JROC, which you said you wanted to talk a little bit about, sure. I think. And actually, I know this is a smart audience here, obviously. But if you could also just explain what the JROC sure. does. Sure. Happy to. Do. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on the classic challenge of the joint force thinking and operating jointly? Uh, which acquisition occurs individually at the service level? And secondly, has AUKUS modified the JROC's views on capability development? And this is from Ben Nicholson at CAE. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Do you first, want me to read those again? I read I got quickly. It. Okay. Uh, so first, uh, the JROC is the Joint Requirements Oversight Council. Um, it's in Title 10. It's chaired by the uh, to, by the vice chairman with the service chiefs uh, at the table. An interesting proposition for them. They wear two hats when they come to me at the <laughs> table. They are part of the JROC, and and we vote and uh, deliberate and then decide on what are the joint requirements for a uh, for a joint fight. Now they come to me also as their service vice chief, so that's a unique tension that that they have. Um, uh, sitting around the table. Um, uh, it's a pretty effective organization. And let me just talk a little bit about what we've been doing to make the JROC more effective. Um, so building on the, on the really great work of my predecessors, Paul Selva and John Hyten particularly, I just saw John in the building today, as a matter of fact. 
Um, we have kind of taken uh, the way that JROC works and transitioned from uh, kind of this idea that the services, we have a requirement, the services bring me a doc, bring me a technology, we rubber stamp it, and then they can go out and buy it, right? So this bottom-up approach. We're now doing a top-down approach, right, which says these are the requirements. And oh, by the way, they devolve now from, we mentioned the joint warfighting concept, 3.0, which is now joint pub one, so instantiated into, into doctrine. They devolve from the concept required capabilities that are resident in JWC 3.0 and, and joint pub one. And so then we write a good requirement and then any stakeholder can come forward and say, okay, I, we can meet that. And so we try to close the gaps that that requirement, mm -hmm. uh, that, that requirement um, identifies. Um, Secondly, we have taken on a, a different approach to rather than looking at it in stovepipes of systems, but we look at it across portfolios of capability. Uh, so very, very important. When you think about things like kill webs and that kind of thing, you want to look at it across capability portfolios. That's in line then with the next thing that we've tried to do to improve the efficiency of the JROC, and that is meld our process uh, uh, kind of simultaneously as opposed to sequentially um, with the acquisition side. So back to those four worlds I live in. So the, uh, they have in the acquisition side of things under Bill of Plants team, they have portfolios review uh, as well. And so we're bringing those together. And the third really exciting one, and you've maybe heard about Replicator and the rest, is the deputy's um, initiative on innovation and what Heidi Shu and her team do. And so that forms a kind of a three-legged stool of portfolios and requirement portfolios and acquisition and portfolios in technology and, and, uh, and R&D. So we're trying to bring that all together. The last thing I would brief you on and what we're trying to do with the JROC, we're trying to put some teeth into that. Right? Um, so the JROC, um, you know, I can yell pretty loudly, uh, but the services don't have to do it. Yeah. I don't have that authority to order them to do it. Interestingly, I was just with my counterparts uh, last week in, um, in uh, the UK and in France uh, and with Australia. They all have that authority. Hmm. So this is our system. It comes out of Title 10 works, there's tension there, we, we make it work, but I want to put some teeth into that, whether that, you know, I think a long-term solution might be, you know, if, if you wanted to change that legislatively, I'm not certain that that's where we'll want to go, uh, maybe, uh, but at the very least, I can do a scorecard that says, hey, all of you JROC members signed, and you all, vice chiefs, you signed up to do this, you said yes, we signed it out. Does that match with what we're seeing in the budget? And if not, then we bring that forward to the secretary and he makes the risk calculus. We can't do that right now. We're gonna leverage data and AI to make sure we can do that. But that's, that's how I, I think in the near term that I have, building other work that my predecessors have done, I can bring some teeth to the JROC as we continue to try to evolve that to make it stronger. AUKUS mm -hmm. um, has not necessarily changed the way we think about it with one notable exception. And this goes back to allies and partners. And so uh, it just so happened that uh, we had initiated the international JROC, which is where I was last week with my Australian and UK counterparts. Sound familiar? Sounds a little bit like a, not the same function, mm -hmm. but what I see happening in the international JROC, we've now had two meetings. We're beyond the norming and storming in the governance phase. We are actually establishing requirements that can, we can work through together. Um, I can see that we will be able to take the output of the IJROC mm -hmm. and be at least one requirements driven input to say AUKUS Pillar 2, which is the new technologies piece. Uh -huh. That's pretty exciting. Huh. Uh, you mentioned dual hatting and we have a question here from an anonymous writer, caller, reader, listener, um, saying how has Senator Tuberville's hold on confirmation impacted the joint force? And you are uniquely positioned on that question because you were almost the acting chairman. Yeah. There was a, you were days away from being the acting chairman yeah. as, as well as the vice, and you, some of the, the vices on the joint staff were serving as actings for a yeah, while. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, the, you know, I'll leave the, the politics of that issue aside um, as they, uh, you know, as they work, uh, they work through that. Um, but I would say that, you know, when you look at the number in the hundreds, 300 uh, uh, you know, or plus now of uh, officers that are being, uh, general officers and flag officers are being involved, there is a cost to that. There's a readiness cost to that for sure. Um, and there's more importantly, just as importantly, there's a personnel cost to that. So think about all of those new one stars or two stars or those three stars are going to move or even the four stars, what that means to their families. They yeah. can't plan. Spouse can't get a new job. Kids can't go to school. They don't know where they're going to live. Uh, 
um, as we keep these things uh, marked in time. There's this idea then, I'll use the JROC as an example. One of the real values of the JROC is you have devices sitting there, right? All that depth and breadth of experience. Um, the folks that are coming now are not the are, are not devices. They're really capable officers, but they come based on the specific issue. That makes sense. That's what I would do if I were in one of the in one of the services until they get their device. But that depth and breadth, how it fits across the entire service portfolio, probably not as strong as it would be if it was a device sitting at uh, um, at the table. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, I do worry a little about retention. So if you're a colonel or a lieutenant colonel or a captain or a navy commander, and you're looking up. You might start asking yourself, is that what I want? And now the answer to my friends who might be listening is absolutely. Stick it out. Let us get through this. We'll solve this problem uh, together. Uh, but I, would, I worry uh, about the value proposition that is being portrayed mm -hmm. about what it means to be a, a GEO or FO. Hmm. Um, is, actually, I want to get to this one question. It's, it's off this topic. but. Um, there's someone asking about Taiwan. Since we're already late to, to deliver $19 billion worth of weapons to Taiwan and only have $1 billion worth of the authorities under the presidential drawdown authority of the PDA, what is the plan to fulfill Taiwan's defense needs? And then I would just add to that, and is there any way to characterize how much more difficult, if at all, that is given the continuing demands by Ukraine and the continuing demands now out of Israel. Yeah, um, so Taiwan is one of the biggest recipients of foreign military sales, 45 billion since 2020, you know, uh, for the last 20 years, excuse me, um, 35 billion of which has already been provided, but the question is a good one because you know, uh, without a budget, without that supplemental, then you will, you'll come to the end of that. So that's a challenge, right? Because what we're trying to do with Taiwan is establish their own ability, their own capability to defend, whether it's leveraging uh, a whole of nation perspective on it, uh, whether it's how they think about mobilization or uh, uh, and uh, how they think about asymmetric warfare, this kind of porcupine theory, mm -hmm. uh, how they think about their own indigenous uh, industry. So we're trying to do all that. And without the, uh, on top of what we're trying to provide them uh, via FMS. So uh, the supplemental is really important and that's our effort to try to get past that. Now you asked about, can we do that? It's a similar challenge in, in Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. I think we have about four and a half billion left to the end of this year. Another supplemental will be required. I I will just end on that point by saying the secretary has been very clear that our, and I believe the alliance too, if it's Chris's view, but the alliance, uh, it's an ironclad commitment to, uh, to, to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, China's been pushing pretty hard on the second Thomas Scholl, and, and there's some who are posturing that it may be there looking at that to see if the U.S. comes to Philippine, the Philippines' defense as a maybe a, a foreshadowing of Taiwan, mm -hmm. what could happen if, mm -hmm. if they were to do something in Taiwan. Sure. Is first off, is, is that having any impact on U.S. military operations in the area, and and how could the U.S. respond to the Second Thomas Shoal? Yeah, well, I, let's let's kind of go up a notch, right? So um, Second Thomas Shoal activity there um, is is reflective of. Um, uh, PRC's desire to make the to make the South China Sea its own lake. Of course, that's not something we hold up to, uh, nor does the international tri new international tribunals, right? Um, and so, this is a direct challenge on the rules-based international order. So, again, with allies and partners, we continue to push back against that. Um, and part of that is support to a treaty ally, which is the uh, Philippines, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, we are able to support them in in, uh, in various ways. This is a case where the probability of buffoonery goes way high, uh, as you start to see um, uh, uh, Chinese uh, PRC, PLAN, or, and more importantly, not PLAN, but kind of white end, white vessels like Coast Guard equivalents uh, uh, participating in an effort to um, to coerce, uh, uh, to coerce Taiwan. Now we've been doing this for a while there. This is not new, but the, the tempo is a little bit higher right now. Is it a test case for what we would do? I, I think it's a test case for the whole rules-based international order, frankly. And what they have seen from us, and particularly the Philippines, as the Philippines continue to do, I, I'm really impressed with what they've been able to do. And I think that's reflective of the strength of the relationship that we have with them, right? And so when, when I think about what indo pacom Command and State Department and the rest have been able to do in the Indo-Pacific over the last two years, whether you think about our relationship with, uh, with the Philippines or Australia or Japan, that trajectory there is really strong because it then it feeds into if I if, if we have if we have 
um, the center of the universe or, 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 or troops are one strategic advantage. At least another is the friends and uh, allies and partners that we have that they do not. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, what you're seeing on the part of the emboldened uh, Philippines who are, who are doing a great job is an example of that. But how, what, how can the, is, is there a way that the U.S. military can already, or I guess can do more to show that support for the Philippines? I, I mean, are we talking more freedom of navigation operations? Like, what can the U.S. military yeah, do? Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, you know, we provide them with, uh, you know, quite a bit as they think about how to handle things in the in the, in the the Second Thomas Shoal. Or, or, but largely, it's about not ceding that battle space in the South China Sea, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're going to fly, sail, operate anywhere where international law allows. And so our presence then in the South China Sea, whether it's freedom of navigation ops, operations that we do quite regularly, whether it's whether it's uh, transits of the of the Taiwan Strait, which is in accordance with international law, both of those are, uh, you will see us continue to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that then reestablishes the rules-based international order, which then I think translates over to, uh, to our allies and partners who know we're going to be there and we're not leaving. We've been there for over a century. Mm -hmm. We're not leaving. Um, I want to take another question. This is from um, Patrick Tucker, Defense One, a reporter. Can you talk about any concerns you have about sufficient access to safely sourced, i.e. not Taiwanese or China, Chinese, microprocessors and other advanced components in order to scale up production of cheaper attack drones under initiatives like the replicator program, which you mentioned earlier? Yeah, so this is a great question because it's all about supply chains, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and, and, um, you know, how, we, how confident are we in the security and surety of those supply chains? So this is a huge effort on the part of DepSecDef and Bill LaPlante and his team. Um, as we take the lessons learned that are coming out of, say, Ukraine and other places about the fragility of our industrial base and add, that, add this issue into how important it is to, uh, to do that nodal analysis and to ensure that... Uh, uh, you know, the, what we buy and what we build with is, is safe and secure. So to, to uh, my colleague's question, that it is a high, of high concern and at the very top of the list when we try to describe what are we looking for from a defense industrial base of the 21st century, that's part of it, a safe and reliable and secure uh, supply chain all the way down to the second, third order tiers and parts suppliers. Huh. Um, we have another one here from Colonel Kevin Coyle. I hope I said that name right. Uh, what is your sense of our report card when it comes to true jointness, where interoperability is seamless and U.S. warfighting domains are truly integrated? Yeah. Um, so interoperability, joint interoperability, I think we're making pretty good strides there. Uh, so efforts like uh, CJAD, C2, or combined joint uh, all domain command and control is, is uh, kind of one of the hot button issues right now. Great progress being made under the department's leadership. Joint staff has a, has a piece of that. Are we completely there to a scorecard piece? No, yeah. uh, we, do, we do have work to do. But if we all move along away from a network centric view to a data centric view uh, where we think about um, agile software development where everything is digitally engineered and digitally manufactured, um, then I think we'll all move along together. That's going to be really, really critical. The services are doing that. Um, and uh, whether it's Air Force, ABMCS, whether it's Navy's uh, overmatch, Army's project convergence, all of these things are coming together. Uh, an example of that is being able to deliver the joint uh, uh, the, the, the joint fires network to um, uh, to Indo-PACOM. That's the, a minimum vile product that we're trying to bring. It's hard, though, right? And uh, a couple of the challenges include getting everybody together on this data-centric uh, theology, the, uh, this theory, and mm -hmm. I think we're in a good place there. It's how do you accommodate legacy systems into that? Um, uh, that's, a, that's a challenge, too, and it, it, it takes time and, and money. Uh, but it's a high priority for the secretary and the deputy. Um, and it's also, back to our friends and allies and partners, we have to do it without leaving with, with them going forward, too. That's pretty tough, too. I know that, that there's not like an end state where you, where you reach this point where, where, of, of this yeah. full interoperability, but is there, I mean, is there, is there any sense of, are we talking years, decades before you get there, or is it just going to be this continuing, evolving yeah. M mission. Yeah, so two points on that. You're right. There is no end state here. If we have an end state, like let's say uh, a specific data standard or something like that, um, that says use these specific fields and all that, th that's looking backward, right? Because we'll establish that and before you know it, it's obsolete, right? Yeah. So we have to have this data centric theory and then, you know, how that, uh, uh, how that plays forward. Um, 
on combined and joint all domain command and control, we have a campaign plan to achieve that. The joint staff does, working with the department. Uh, and its timeline is 2027 to bring uh, viable product to Indo-PACOM specifically. Well, and uh, so that means we're moving pretty quickly because we want to get it into the field and trained and ready to go by 27. And then there's our part two to that campaign plan, which will take us into, into uh, kind of JAD C2 next uh, going forward. So let's get to what we need in 27 and then build, build out the rest. I, I know that you, Secretary Austin, has, has recently, m multiple occasions, talked about being able to walk and chew gum when asked about all these various yeah. threats. And we heard General Jones talk about the multiple threat streams that are all at the same time. But I'm wondering about when you, when you, when you are looking about, uh, talking about designing um, a future force, how much things like, again, the invasion of Ukraine, what's happening in Israel, looking to the potential for an invasion of Taiwan, uh, all of these, uh, again, the, the attacks in Iraq and Syria, just these constant threats around the world. If you think there is, you're able to, to get enough focus, whether it be at the Pentagon, whether it be at the Joint Staff, whether it be budgetary, sure. to actually really move the Joint Force along to keep up with all of these threats. Sure. Um, so Joint Force design, let me just step back. In the two years that I've been in this job, all of the r wicked hard problems are joint problems, right? Yeah. Um, and maybe with the exception of one domain, maybe the undersea domain where, you know, kind of the Navy's got that one. Everything else is a joint domain that we're working on, right? And maybe even in the undersea, there, you know, the other services can uh, come in. So it's all, everything's a joint problem. So if you think about, uh, uh, air and cruise missile defense of the homeland, a joint problem. If you think about joint strike fighter, a joint problem. If you think about unmanned aerial systems and counters therein, a joint problem, right? So all of the problems, uh, problem sets are, uh, are are joint problems. So when we think about joint force design and development, then um, that's just the that's just the ecosystem that we live in, right? Maybe different than maybe it was back in 1986 when they built a JROC that said, you know, and the authorities that we have now maybe a little bit different, right? So everything is everything is joint. So we go forward then thinking about what are the attributes of the joint force that we want, and then what are the problems that we need to solve? What are the what are the capability gaps that we need to close as a as a joint force? That's the power of the joint warfighting concept, right? So it establishes all of those concept required capabilities, which can be both material and non-material solutions, right? So we tend to think a lot about material solutions, rightly so, uh, but there's non-material solutions too about uh, how we uh, how we can get together. I would say when I think about um, when I think about force design, you know, kind of building future force development, the work that the services do, the man training, equip, you know, that foundry side, uh, force generation services, getting the heavy metal trained and going forward, um, and then finally force employment. Of those three, we're pretty good at force employment. The COCOMs are really good at what they do. Force generation, services know how to spin up a carrier strike group, get it ready so it's certified and ready to go. Force development, given the programs they have, they buy the right stuff, they get everybody trained and manned up. It's the force design where we need to spend some more time. Chairman Milley was all about this, and boy is General Brown about us, Chairman Brown all about this, right? So he's asking all the right tough questions about what does force design mean, force development mean, uh, into the future, because we gotta get that right. Everything's a joint problem. Um, we're almost out of time, but I have to ask you about Ukraine. What has the conflict in Ukraine taught you about about the needs for the, the future force? Yeah. What, what's one or two main takeaways you've, you've seen from how the campaign has been fought in, in Ukraine? Yeah, the, the speed and urgency would be one. So if you look at the great work that the Ukrainian armed forces have been able to do to innovate uh, at the speed of relevance on, at the, that the battlefield requires. We need to be able to do that too, right? And so when I think then about matching capability, portfolio reviews from a JROC perspective and uh, what uh, Bill the Plan is doing and now bringing in the innovation side that, that Heidi Shu and her team has, that's really, really powerful. So how can we go faster, turn faster than the enemy to, uh, to innovate? Um, so, so, so that's one. And then op, kind of thinking and operating differently, um, counter U, UAS and counter US is a classic example of that. Um, yeah, we're seeing a little bit of hypersonics play out on the battlefield. So a little Spanish Civil War going on there and what we're seeing, unfortunately people are dying and we, we, wanna, we would hope to be able to, to stop that. Now, yes, so that's how we start thinking about what the you know, a joint force of the future uh, might look like. Now on the flip side, trenches, mines, obstacles, uh, the importance of combined arms maneuver, being able to move 
and shoot at the same time. Those are lessons that uh, we ha have been validated. Mm -hmm. And so I guess to kind of put a, a fine point on it, we don't we want to focus on the future, but we can't forget that other stuff because it's still pretty powerful when huh. the bullets start flying. Um, one thing that General Jones failed to mention in the intro about you is that you, anyone who's been in your office will know this, you're a Notre Dame super fan. Yes. Uh, you also are a Texas fan? Son and money went to Texas. Right. We've, we've talked about some very difficult issues here today. China, Auburn Israel. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Uh, China, Israel, some complicated national security, but I'm really going to put you on the spot right now. Yeah. What do you think of the NCAA decision for the college football playoff? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you don't have enough time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Florida? Florida State. Florida State, yeah. Florida State, yeah. Um, Why well, play the games? Really? But they don't count, right? So you go 13-0, and 0, uh, you do everything you ask, you win your conference, you do it with the third-string quarterback, you do it with defense. We say defense wins championships all the time. I guess not. I guess it doesn't matter because it's all about the eye test. So um, I am opposed to that decision um, because, you know, they did everything they were, that we asked them to do, and uh, they should be in the, in the college football playoffs. When is Notre Dame's year? Next year. It's next. always next year. I thought year it was party. next year. It's and then next year. finally, and this is the critical question, mm. Army, Navy, who wins? Yeah. So joint. So, I, you know, as a, as a uh, you know, Notre Dame plays Navy every year, it's better for our strength of schedule if Navy wins. Uh, <laughs> I'm wearing this uniform, but it's, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. Both, both right. teams are great. Well, now we've really learned about you yeah. after all of that. Thank you very much for your Thank time. Thank you. We really appreciate it. You Thank bet. you very much.